Today on the show, we have Robert Allen Peeler, current community manager at Unbroken Studios and former community manager at Kojima Productions Los Angeles. How's it going today, buddy? Well, I want to say a proper hello by opening my drink here. <laughs> Cheers. What are you drinking? Uh, I am I'm a non-alcoholic person, so I'm drinking Diet Coke, which is my go-to. So yeah, apologies for the non-hard edged nature of my person. No, it's okay. I'm I'm drinking Coca Cola as well. There's just uh, there's just extra bits in it. You're crocked, aren't you? Hey, I'm Fingers. Hey everyone, this is Days Ahead. And I'm Nitroid. You're listening to the Kojima Frequency. So what was the uh, the drink of choice at Kojima Productions Los Angeles? Uh, Diet Coke. For me, anyway. Diet Coke. Um, I'm sure plenty of other people imbibed otherwise. There's plenty of coffee going around, too. Yeah, but did you have, like, the like every game studio has their, like, in-house perks. Like, Valve has the candy room. EA's got, like, the cereal machines. Like, did you guys have anything like that? I didn't have any machines. We had a kitchen with cereal in it. And we also had uh, a bowl that was... Freshly uh, replenished with fruit, and I don't know where that fruit came from. Um, I'd like to say the studio somehow paid for fruit to show up, but it's just as likely that someone was just volunteering to bring fruit every day. I like to imagine Kojima is like a fruit Santa Claus, just like coming in and just like giving you guys fruit real quick and then dipping out. There's some bananas. <laughs> <laughs> bananas, oranges, and apples is what I remember, but there might have been others. I, I'm not a big fruit person, so that was mostly for everyone else. We're going to keep talking about food and like everybody listening is going to be like, why? Just no. ask something interesting. <laughs> well, not like I never answer anything interesting. Come on. I know my job. <laughs> Even when I don't have that job, I know my job. Sorry. No. Um. Yeah. No, we had lots of cereal. I liked, I like cereal and it's not good for you, but we ate plenty of it. Um, like all, at all hours of the day. That does have to be hard though. Like, mitigating and 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 figuring out like what's okay to say in this situation versus what's not okay like 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 just out of curiosity like what's your what's your thought process like typically when you have to deal with something like that i usually try to plan ahead um so i'm not surprised by anything anyone would ask of me um and it's i was actually talking to someone about this today so a lot of people you know there's different moderation tools and uh mods and dashboards and things for social media or any really place where you speak publicly and people are always trying to put in some sort of automated solution to keep you from saying the wrong thing or talking to the wrong person and I was saying to someone today that a lot of those are great and I'm really glad that people are like working towards the technology to you know read the room and and provide the the best possible response but really what seems to work better at a greater efficiency is just knowing what you're talking about when you're there. So like just being someone who doesn't have, uh, you know, a lack of information or, you know, in, in my case for metal gear, just being familiar with the game, being familiar with the person I'm talking to, being aware of what people might want to know or what they don't know yet, that kind of stuff. So it, it all seems pretty simple, but you'd be surprised at how many people are like, so exactly how am I supposed to answer this question? And I'm like, well, <laughs> if, you, if you have an idea of what this game is and if you have an idea of what people know and don't know, maybe you can arrive to that conclusion naturally. But there's there's lots of ways, you know, there's press training, there's, uh, you know, you can do a lot of pre-written questions. You can um, put things together and be like, oh, what's the, not necessarily script, but like, oh, what would I typically run into? Um I won't spoil all the magic, but basically that. God, I bet with this community in general, because anal retention is kind of our, you know, modus operandi. If you're talking to someone who's like, I have the most meticulous, precise um, question related to the narrowest of fields related to your product, and you better know the precise answer to it. I think most people in my field would be like, next or pass <laughs> just just not answer just be like move on because you know it's all minefields right and people want to trip you up and i wouldn't necessarily say a community wants to trip you up but there's plenty of people out there who are like well let's see if they can answer this one bam and 
toss you something and they want to be impressed, but they are looking to be disappointed. So yeah, it's <laughs> just better to just walk away and be like, yeah, no, thanks. I'm, I'm on my own here. And it's probably something they already have the answer to. They just kind of just want to like flex on you and be like, this is what I know. Actually, you know, just, actually, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of those people. Yeah, I made a I made a I retweeted a Pliskin joke for the movie announcement today. Like it said something like one out of four of these characters is Solid Snake. Please pick one. And then one of them was Pliskin. And someone messaged me on my Twitter that was like, well, actually, Plis- it's three people, not four. Pliskin is the same person as Snake. It's like, that's it. That's the joke. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for figuring that out. You know, you yeah, guys... well, the, the Pliskin joke is like, you know, bottom of the iceberg level, you know, right? <laughs> right? You know, inside humor, though. So <laughs> it's always funny when someone trips over it. That's why at the end of the day, I, I, I definitely feel for these uh, journalists and stuff that are just trying to put out a damn article. There's people just like, no, that's not Solid Snake. That's Venom Snake. <laughs> or it's just like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Now you got to say to yourself, and I, since I know my audience, what does that say about Metal Gear Solid 2 if Pliskin references are at the bottom of the iceberg? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just, just throwing out some truth bombs here that you maybe re-examine your life. There, you know, believe it or not, there is actually a Metal Gear Solid 2 iceberg meme image that's floating around out there. There you go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got some weird stuff on it, like uh, IGN early build of the game that still has pre 9 11 content it's 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 a it's a trip well i am your guest but if you don't mind i'd like to throw out some some topics of discussion for you guys to uh talk about with me if that's cool with you go for it do it yeah sure so the first one i want to throw out there is is i actually listened to a few of your podcasts already thanks for listening i i am a fan i will say Yes. Um, I'll, t- I'll tell you, I listened to episode one, episode five, jumped ahead, episode 14, episode 15, a little bit of episode 18, a little bit of episode 19. I can only stomach Maxwell for so long. And uh, <laughs> and then, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll probably listen to this, the police notes. Oh, well. Max, I'm so sorry. Shout out to Maxwell. Yeah, he knows who I am. Um, but I wanted to point out that I listened to the one with Garrett on here, and you guys were were like gushing over this guy and how much Metal Gear he's played. And I just happened to conveniently look at my uh, Steam profile and noticed that my playtime was significantly higher than his. And I just wanted to, you know, let that drop. And uh, uh, What kind of numbers are we talking here? Uh, I mean, maybe you should try to guess. What was that? What was Garrett at? Do you remember? <sighs> what do you say? Over 300 or something? Or over something 500? Like that. Yeah. Okay, go a little higher. I think because I think I was at like three hundred. Did you get over a thousand? I was about to say a thousand. Uh, where we're at twelve hundred. Go a little higher. All right, oh I was, I, mine's twelve hundred. We're doing prices right. Days, what you got? Uh, fuck. I don't have my PlayStation Four on me, so one dollar, Bob. No, how many hours do you think he played? Oh, who, Rob? Yeah, yeah. On Steam, Steam specifically. Don't even count uh, the other consoles. This is just Steam. Okay, that makes shit easier. Uh. Did somebody say go for the $1? <laughs> uh, fuck. $1,500? Go a little higher. Sorry. Oh, oh my God. Wow. All right. So, no, we all lose. Where you at? 3,805 in six hours. Holy. Jesus Christ. Hey, we got a real gamer here. Yeah, so. All right. I'm just saying, if you're going to bring people on as guests, maybe you should bring on people who play the games. Uh, <sighs> I'll put some respect Man. on the... I feel Garrett, hurt. if you're it listening, long. you got to step it up. You're getting called out. <laughs> Garrett's a poser. Confirmed. <laughs> <clears throat> no, that guy's awesome. He he played more Survive than me. I'll give him that. Yeah, shouts out to Garrett. KPLA was mostly focused on MGO3, right? Yeah, almost 100%. What sort of plans did you have for that? Like, provided everything hadn't gone the way it did, you know, were there kind of long-term things you wanted to go into with it? or? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, when you make a game you know, that's an online multiplayer game, you hope that it'll do well and you can continue developing more for it. Um, so we had lots of ideas in Flux. There were things that we wanted to get done, but when you're developing that kind of game, you have to obviously have something for launch and then you can, can you can have some stuff that you were working on and maybe put it on the side or put it in a state where you're getting ready to do more to it uh, once the game keeps working on uh, going past launch. But 
you know, uh, of course it didn't do as well as we wanted to. And then the studio got shut down and that pretty much kind of ended that situation. So yeah, nothing more we could add to it really. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we are clearly kind of touchy with this subject because we understand what scrutiny might come under it. So for me, I kind of want to look at, look at this as more of like a corporate perspective, like handling what you would expect from big corps, you know, random closures, uh, dealing with upper management, sea levels, but in the context of Metal Gear. So that, that was my approach to this, um, just to make it not too controversial. Uh, but then everything happened today, and I totally forgot what I was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a, a, a huge... It's unfortunate that the, the pervasive attitude towards everything that happened uh, re-Kojima Productions Konami tends to be the least charitable possible position towards Konami and the people who worked there, uh, including you to some degree, I'd assume. Uh, I, mean, I, God, I don't even want to imagine the kind of flack you got when that was going down. I mean, I didn't tell him to leave the company. So, I well, I just mean, I just mean in <laughs> terms yes, of yes, uh, the kind of stuff that comes my way. Sure, I understand that. Um, yeah, that, that's more of what I meant. Like people attacking you. But I guess that's my perspective, right? Is I I know when people are saying something that makes them angry, right. or, or or demonstrating their ire towards some subject. It's not about me personally, even if they're telling me about it. You know, I, I don't take it personally because I'm like, well, that wasn't my plan for anything. Yeah, that's a that's definitely you got to have like just at least just like the right headspace to deal with that type of stuff. You know, you're just like, all right, these are just people that are pissed off. I get it. And like I mean, says, I mean, it's not a personal thing that they're coming at you. They're just mad at something that happened with the product. So I can genuinely feel bad <clears throat> for anybody who um, you know still operates a Metal Gear account or a Konami account. And I think I know who still runs those. So, um, whoever, you know, when they're getting messages that are people like, Oh, this is still makes me angry after five years. I'm like, well, you know, until that yeah. gets resolved, that's going to be what happens. <laughs> and and I, they know that too. They're not, you know, unaware. So it's not one of those things where it's like, you know, surprises. Oh yeah. Going into that role, you got to just like, know what you're signing up for, for sure. Yeah. I mean, is that a fair thing to say then that, if you're going to be a, a community manager or or you're going to work in that field, is it fair to say that it's in the job description that you're going to be getting that that kind of response, that you're going to have to deal with that kind of flack? I wouldn't put it in a job description because that just seems cruel. Um, but what I would, <laughs> but if I were, you know, if I were applying for a new position, I would not be unaware that somehow I'd run into any potential negative criticism or any sort of. Uh, concerns and how vitriolic they could possibly get yeah. just because I had the experience. If someone's coming in this field brand new, let that be a warning that that is a potentiality. Now that's not to say it's warranted because it most certainly is almost never warranted. Yeah, um, No one deserves to be belittled or berated on the internet for any reason. And I will defend those who are treated as such when they are not the ones, uh, you know, causing any sort of situations or even if they are, I mean, civility is one of my top goals for any sort of online conversation. Um, for sure. But at the same time to not expect it is naive. So it's just one of those things where you are a diplomat in a sort of circumstance and it is your job to diffuse situations as best as possible. And if they can't be diffused, you defer or delay them and then you bring it up again. But I consider it taking an L or, um, not doing my job properly if I just avoid or ignore critique and criticism because that's I'm there to take it. That's I'm there to receive and cycle that feedback in, in a constructive way. Yeah, and that's the thing. There's there's criticisms where they're definitely, you know, there's being where they're being constructive and then there's just, oh, this sucks. I hate it, you know, death threat. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Well, death threats is, get their own special category of who, what authorities do we contact? But yeah. right. <laughs> just just letting you guys know that not you particularly, but anybody who's listening oh, for sure in yeah. advance. That's where that goes in my uh, pol policy decision making. So yeah, it's really crazy how how wild people are online. Just like the stuff that they say, they just think you know you're behind a screen, and so it's okay. It's like well, it's not. So <laughs> not to get political, um, but 
I, you know, when I see that kind of thing in uh, recent situations, it makes me even more upset because most of the people who are receiving this treatment are not prepared for it. Um, and they're just doing their job on a totally unrelated level and they're getting thrust into those situations. So it's one of those things where it makes me mad when any organization doesn't go through the process of putting together some sort of team or manager or individual to receive all front-ended communication. And if they're not ready for that, that they just don't allow that communication because it's not, they're not prepared for it. They're not prepared to receive it and they can't protect their own employees without it. Yeah. And I mean, if you're the kind of person who's throwing that kind of crap out there, it's your opinion is not worth listening to in the first place. Yeah. But this is a dour topic. Let's move on to something more jovial, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Back to soda. No, just kidding. This is something I've actually wanted to, to say to you for a while. Um, as a guy who kind of showed up on your doorstep out of nowhere at E3, thank you so much for for being so hospitable towards me. <laughs> hey, no problem. Because I realized I was not on the guest list. I just kind of <laughs> came with a friend. I was the plus one, and you were the the kindest person imaginable. So thank you for that. I'll make it clear. I worked that out almost immediately. <laughs> where I was like, wait, who are you? What's going on? <laughs> but no, you were you were a fantastic guest. Happy to happy to have thank you, you so on. Much. Even impromptu. Uh, I hope you had a good time. I'm I sad have we not stopped to raving about it. Yeah, that was a that was a great time, and I, I man, you made me want Korean barbecue so much after that. Oh man, Chosen Galbi's the best. Oh, that's the name of the restaurant. I couldn't remember it. Yeah, I'll send you a link. It's it's um, in Koreatown. So as you'd imagine, I want to take my uh, I want to take my wife someday because she needs to experience that. Come on over here when we can again. I'll take you myself. We'll all go together. Hell yes. Aww. Making it's connections. Awesome. Fingers crossed. <laughs> you can ask me more questions about my current work, which I can't answer anyway. Um, well, yeah, I was going to say, I know <laughs> you can't talk too much about what you're doing now, but you did kind of make the jump from a AAA company to an indie company, essentially, right? Uh, in a manner of speaking, I don't know that I want to call it indie because that, that label is a little strange to me. Yeah, um, and I, I took a look at the company and they're they're pretty big. Yeah, we don't make anything that's like, we're not making nostalgic 80s or 90s you know bit trip to style anything which a lot of people would associate with indies and again i don't want to say like well we're like call of duty size or anything like that it's not that it's it's more like um and and that's not even to disparage indie because lord knows i love tons of indie games um it's more along the lines of i don't want to give anyone the impression that i went from you know, Square Enix to Kojima Productions to right. a startup. It's more along the lines of what we're making is AAA products. What we're working on are AAA products. We're working in a co-dev with another AAA studio. Um, we are working on licensed IP, uh, things that people, when they find out about it, will be like, oh, holy crap, that that's awesome. And I wouldn't expect them to think otherwise. Um, but, of course, since I can't talk about it, it's all just conjecture, right? I'm just right. spouting it out, so... Uh, believe me or you don't, but when I reveal, I'll be happy to share. And I really, really am looking forward to talking with the community about the stuff we've been working on. And thankfully, I've been able to do a bit more uh, than my previous community management experience, mostly for the fact that since we don't have a game to be talking about, I can't really foster a community through it. Um, so I've been you know, engaging in a lot of uh, various tasks in production and development, which make me really happy to be trying something new. So look forward to that. Look forward to see my name on a different type of credit. Maybe you never know. Ooh. That said, Oh, I could bring up something I want to bring up. Um, Nitroid. When are we going to, I call you Nitroid. That's what I call you. So if you pronounce it any other <laughs> no, way. You, you pick on me on it's a Nitroid. regular basis and, and <laughs> we're going to have, we're going we're gonna to have fisticuffs one of these days, man. That was why I was really excited about you as a guest. It's not fair. <laughs> I don't deserve this kind of abuse, man. I don't know. I think maybe you'll do a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, you s sneak yourself into those little <laughs> gatherings. Oh of people. man! Every it's like you're going to get paid for it. <laughs> every time I am suffering on Twitter, you are right there to to, to drive the nail in a bit. <laughs> oh, I love when uh, uh, remakes come up, and I'm like, oh, it's going to hurt it right. This is going to be so good. <laughs> 
Uh, something I was curious about, um, and I don't know how much you can talk about it, but the the Fox engine, I've had a theory for a long time about that, and I was wondering if maybe you could weigh in on it. Probably um, not, but you can try. <laughs> was there ever any intent to like develop the Fox engine out and license it to other developers? Was that ever on the table? I couldn't say yes or no. I don't know that answer. Um, I mean, they obviously made it because they wanted to make games out of it. Uh, we've made a few already with it. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, they'd continue using it if it was considered in their opinion, the best option, but I don't know about licensing. I mean, I worked at square before and they made their own engines as well and they never even considered licensing it out. Um, oh, that's right. You did work at square. I forgot yeah. about that. And they did, they did, they put a ton of work into engine development. They had whole teams working for years to make what they considered to be the premier engine to make the premier games for more than two decades at this point <clears throat> at least and yeah they never i never saw any inclination they were licensed it out but let's say it was the best engine ever right and it serviced them for a decade and they made a thousand games and it was a super successful thing maybe they then would have considered licensing out you know it's like it's not a yeah a never say never it's a never say never situation there's there's always the potential yeah. but I never was told personally to do that. Yeah. The thing that made me wonder that was the positioning of, of Kojima Productions in Los Angeles, being that close to Hollywood, you know, with shows like The Mandalorian now using Unreal Engine for environments, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So, you know, and, and there was this big push of the Fox engine being Hollywood level in terms of visual fidelity. So I was just kind of wondering, like, that's what led me down that path of wondering, like, hmm, you know, is this is this where this is going? Well, you have no reason to discount the um, viability of the Unre Unreal Engine, first of all. So regardless right. of how good Kojima uh, productions were at creating an engine, how good the Fox engine was at anything, Unreal is pretty... Um, ubiquitous across the industry, which is, first of all, it's number one selling point. Everyone knows how to use it. Everyone can use it. It's got a massive uh, library and community of developers adding to it on a regular basis to just make it even more compatible with anything you could possibly want to do. And then on top of that, it makes things look glorious. So <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, seriously. there's no like shortage of amazing looking games that use Unreal to build their games. So it'd be one of those scenarios where, sure, the Fox engine could have potentially been this amazing thing that everyone used and overtook Unreal and various other platforms, but it didn't, and Unreal's great, so let's not worry about it. Fair enough. There's still all that time where everybody has to just like start at ground zero and just like learn that whole system too, and then you're you know you're, you're well, of course, yeah. That's I think that's the biggest hurdle. Someone who has to yeah build you know it's not just building an engine that does things; it's building the tools and the usability and the um the libraries and just everything you want to add to game development that makes it more more purposeful for choosing as a main engine to make a game i mean i think didn't uh, kojima productions for death stranding pick uh, the engine made out of you know gorilla right yeah i think it's called like decima decima yeah, yep. so they they picked that because from their estimation, it did the things they wanted to do, <clears throat> and they probably had the support structure at Gorilla to help them use an engine they may have been unfamiliar with. Um, but I could have seen just as easily seen them use Unreal if they found it to be what they wanted. Um, it's not an either or, I think. And that's what just, Square's doing now too, isn't it? They've they've pretty much shifted over to Unreal for most of the projects. Yeah, I mean. They didn't do that for the longest time because, uh, you know, it was, it was, I think, I think, I mean, again, speculation, but I think it's a, a moment of pride, um, to say, Hey, we make this game from scratch with the engine we built with our hands. Um, I'm sure that's not it completely, but it does sound like one of those things that, uh, you know, a team that's been around for a long time or teams and developers have been around for a long time are like, well, we're the premier, we're the ones who do it. So let's do it ourselves. Why not? Um, but a lot of people are finding, you know, it's no, there's no, we're not losing anything by just getting unreal and doing it this way. Cause now we have the ability to broaden our reach to different people. And if there is truly something that they can't do with it, yeah, by all means look elsewhere and see if you can find something you can work with. Um, at unbroken, we definitely 
use the Unreal Engine. It's our bread and butter. So uh, there's always the possibility we'll use something else, I suppose, but it, is, it does seem extremely unlikely considering that we've had so much success with it. Yeah, and un- Unreal 5 around the corner doing crazy things. Just, man, okay. that tech demo was nuts. I feel like I just got Unreal 4. Don't don't be throwing things more at me. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that was an impressive tech demo. So yeah, you know, things continue. And Fox Engine is more than five years old at this point, so it's not like yeah, it's, it should be used anymore And if you could do something better. Yeah, a lot of people are still kind of like, oh, why aren't you using the Fox Engine for the new Metal Gear? Like, they should use the Fox <laughs> Engine. And that, yeah, that's that's kind of old now. I mean, it's not. I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty sure no one's supporting it anymore. So it would, it would have needed regular support in order to be a, the most viable engine for work. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Are they still using it for the soccer games? No, they moved to Unreal. Oh, uh, okay. Shit. Yeah. And I think this kind of speaks to to what we've talked about before in a sense that, you know, gamers always want to have that magical, like, anime moment where what they dreamed about wants to happen. But there's so much that goes into it, like you said. In real is standardized. Fox Engine, nobody knows about it. Yes, Fox Engine Fox Engine is great because it does run on a potato, but from a software development perspective especially from two people who work in software development it's just it's non-viable as much as we'd like it to be it's just i mean i think it's even a strange ask it's like why do we care that anyone uses fox engine anymore like this yeah is, exactly it's, again this is an old engine like it's not currently being used on anything because no one's currently working on it it's like it's like point? it's it's like walking into a business and being like okay guys uh so we're gonna use office 2003 yeah, and I know I, you guys I got really familiar with 365. I really liked Office 2003. You had a great marketing hell. campaign. Let's make it happen. It's like bring back know. Clippy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like okay, sure. Like let's, let's, you do have to give it to him though. Fox Engine was it was a smooth engine. I, I love that engine. Sure, it's a testament to the Metal Gear Solid Two was a great game, but I don't want to play it right now. So <laughs> 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 again, just just digging it a little deeper. Why you got to do that to me? Why? <laughs> you know, I just want to play newer games. Sorry. Sorry. I got other things to do. <laughs> oh, Glad man. I have a drink. <laughs> you guys want to talk about <laughs> engines, man. Talk about something. It's not hard fun. Let's talk about video games. Jeez. All right. What are you playing? Who am I talking to? You guys are, oh, why aren't we what are you playing these days, man? <laughs> um... Well, I just got a PS5, so I have nice. been playing PS5 games. I pretty close to platinuming Bug Snacks of all things. <laughs> that game looks so weird. Uh, well, my daughter really wanted to play it, so and she she played it and beat it and platinumed it, and it's her first platinum. Aww. She's ten. She's ten years old, and nice. she turned to me and she's like, "You need to play this game. It is great, and I want to uh, have more Bug Snacks in my life. So play it so I can watch you." Aww. So I've been playing it. I think Fan Gamer just came out with a, a Bug Snacks line. So if you're looking for a Christmas gift, it's a short game, but it's pretty fun actually. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Like it, to me, is a um, I would like consider it the kooky dark uh, version of Pokemon. I have heard it's got a twist to it, but I don't know what. I need I mean, to. I need to finish of, it. Regardless of the twist, I just think it's fun to have little food come up to you and say their name like a Pokemon says its name but instead of just being like a, a, a made up name that kind of sounds like an element it's like more cute like they have bugs and their name Shishka Bugs <laughs> and they and, and the voice actor is like Shishka Bug and it's just so perfect because you're like oh my gosh it's exactly Pokemon but in characters that I really just want to eat and also look at but, yeah. See, I feel bad because I got a PS5 and I've been mainly using it just to play PS4 games at proper frame rates. Nice, and it's been great. You know, I haven't even tried runs that yet. Super smooth. I haven't. Even oh tried man, it's that wonderful. Yet. I've only been playing PS5 games. Well, I, haven't, I I don't get as much time as my old man complaint. I don't get as much time to play as I'd like to. Um, but I am sneaking in some stuff. I got. I'm nearly platinumed Miles Morales. I did platinum Astro Playroom. Astro's Playroom is surprisingly good. Well, you know, <laughs> I always disagree with you, so I apologize in advance. It feels like I'm very contrarian. It's not bad, but it's nostalgic. It's, not, it's just nostalgic. Yeah, it's not. So it's fun and bright and pretty and cool, 
but it's not like the best platformer or it's not like a challenge or it's not like a replayable scenario. It's like, you did it and you got it all done. Now you can look at it. All right, I'm done. Yeah, I'm not going to play it again, but I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, But it's more than I would expect from a free game, given that this is 2020. You know, it's not like we're back in the 80s and Nintendo is bundling Super Mario Brothers with their console. Like, that's not what this is. You know, this is we're lucky to get anything with the console. I think it's amazing. Yeah, I think it's amazing that it even showed up at all. Like, I wasn't expecting a free game outside of Bug Snacks. Right. And when it was there, I was like, oh. Yeah, I'll play this, and it was fun and really cool, and I love the, the use of the, the haptic feedback. Um, it's definitely the game that uses it more than any other game, yeah. despite other games using it in a reasonable way. It's like everything shakes you, but I'm not sure if it's annoying or not yet. Well, it's that <laughs> demo game. It, you know, it's going to it's going to wear out uh, its welcome in terms of that feature, just because yeah. it's there. But um, it at least gives you like. This is the potential, and that's really cool. I definitely don't want to blow my controller for anything ever again. Oh, God, I hate doing that. <laughs> but it's just, I guess it's cool you can. Um, I remember doing it, was it on the Vita, when you had to, like, clear away stuff on, like, the oh, yeah, you Uncharted did. game. And I'm, like, I had it on the DS as yeah, well. Yeah, on Phoenix, yeah. right? I was thinking about that yeah, when so you're like, brushing for fingerprints. This is a thing that, yeah, you could do it, but should you? Um, <laughs> you could just yell at it, too. It was pretty much just, like, a noise threshold. So now I'm going to talk about the game you hate. Uh, I did start playing uh, Demon Souls on PS5. Um, I mean, I got, I got it too. So. <laughs> See, right? And I got through the first level um, pretty easily. And I played it on PS3. I have it on PS3, but uh, I never beat it on PS3 just because it's it was not it was my first Souls game, and I was just kind of like, yeah, I don't got time for this. But um, I've since obviously become a bigger fan of souls born games. Got to add the born in there. Um, souls born hero. And so I want to, I want to, yeah. So I want to beat this one, but, and you're going to cry. I don't want to go back and play the PS3 one anymore. I'm sincerely not interested in going to the old system of graphics. I think you're going to make Maxwell matter than me. <laughs> I know. I know I'll make him matter, but he's not on the show. So, <laughs> 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 it's the thing is and, and you know we had this discussion a long time ago about like oh well if new ones come out you won't want to play the old one and i said oh you certainly could and there's viability for doing that and he's like yeah but you're less likely to and i disagreed with him when because we were talking about shadow Colossus at the time and i disagreed with him and i still do but when it comes to demon souls uh he makes a good point but the thing is it's not a bad thing in my mind <laughs> because playing the old game is not necessary in my mind, and this is where you're going to disagree with me, Detroit, is, is it's not necessary to get the experience they were trying to give you. And I know you hang your hat on like the muted colors and the dreariness of walls and whatnot, but I do feel very similar playing this game as when I felt when I played PS3 game. And like, I do remember all the things that I remembered playing the PS3 game. And I do kind of get the same, like, um, I don't know, like just moodiness. I do feel that same that same sense of uh, dread in certain parts. I get all those things, and I didn't get in differently when I played the PS3 version. So if someone does play the PS3 version, and they do feel differently when they play the PS5 version, that is such a, a unique, singular experience for that person that kind of throwing a blanket over it and saying that everyone's going to run into that same issue seems uh, glib. At best, I'm going okay. to throw out the argument because just everyone gets something different out of everything. And if they didn't get that sense that you got because of muted colors or because of, um, you know, lower res textures, then that doesn't mean they're not going to enjoy a PS5 version and, and get that same sense. Of, you know, it's just it's a unique experience. Everyone feels differently, right? Okay, so you're kind of putting me on the spot here. I am putting you on the spot <laughs> because these are the kind of conversations we need to have. All right, let me let me pose this to you. Can you imagine a piece of media where your argument would not apply, or do you think it's broad? Or I think it's broad. I mean, obviously, I can imagine a lot of things, but what I'm I'm so, not talking I'm not talking about the hypothetical no remake should be made. It's more like this remake succeeded in my mind is what I'm saying. So. So you think it's it has more to do with whether or not a remake succeeds at 
communicating what specifically? Uh, I mean, there's a couple values. One, you could say, I want it to communicate exactly the intention broadly of the developer that made the original. Or you could say, I wanted to do that, but do it even better than they did it. Because you could argue, and I'm not, na- I'm not making that argument, but you could argue that the original Demon Souls did not succeed at its goal. Again, I'm not making that argument. I'm just saying that if there is to be an argument about remakes, you could say, oh, well, mm. this new one does a better job than they did on their intended goal. And I'm not saying it does. I'm just saying that yeah, it's-, it's one of those things where I have no problem never playing the PS3 one again, most likely. I'm not going to say never, I say never, because I may come back to that and be like, no, I kind of do want to check it out. But at the same time, it is, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm losing subjective. anything. It is. I grant so, to that. It's not a, it's not a known thing, known quantity. It is. A, there are two ways that this could go, or at least two ways that I see, because I can think of two examples of remakes that, uh, could, I could see some people replacing the original with in sort of their headspace. Um, one that is more in line with the podcast would be the twin snakes. And there's a lot of debate there as to whether or not that was a, that was a, a a good, uh, remake or not. Another one that I think everyone would agree is not a good remake. Uh, and, and this is a rather, rather than, than look at games. Um, did you ever see Spike Lee's remake of old boy? No. And I never saw the original either. So. Oh no, man. Oh no. We got to <laughs> fix that. Oh, nobody got time for that. Old experience. Man, you got to make time for that. <laughs> now you, now you got something against him. That just hurts, man. All right, all right. Without examples, just give me your point. I guess I mean it's it's subjective to say whether or not a remake is 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 better than Okay, I guess this is kind of what I'm what I'm uh circling around here. Is better the word we want to settle on for for comparing a remake to its original? Well, I, and I wouldn't have thought so. Because, and again, the argument I made to Maxwell is that, you know, the previous always exists. It's never going to just disappear. Um, you know. Right, but like you said, now that you've got the Demon's Souls remake, you're you're not inclined to ever play the original again. Yes, for the, in this instance, because, again, we talked about how this, this is individual for everyone, but I felt like... Because I played the original, I did. And I felt like this is the game I played before. It's just prettier now, more or less. I think it's too early to tell. Like, give it some time, and then maybe you might feel a little different, like want to go back and try the PS3 version. No, it's you know, definitely, that's definitely because true. Because it's the new thing, like you're like you're drawn to it and kind of like, all right, yeah, I appreciate the, the quality of life improvements here and there, but you're going to eventually miss that cat. The, the <laughs> yeah. be like, well potentially so right. potentially so but usually and this is this is why i, I butt heads with, with him about it is usually when the points of what's missing or the points of what's coming up um that you will lose or the things that get out of your headspace are brought up like you can't lose that that's the most virtuous and, and valuable aspect i just often disagree with like well that's is that the most virtuous about it? that seems very i wouldn't like, say it's it the like, most this seems like minutia that doesn't really add anything to anything it's just a oh i happen to remember it so don't you dare take it away kind of moment right but it's a gestalt it's the it's the sum of its parts you know it's not just any well, individual thing yeah it's but if the, this is like a puzzle all piece. of these things sort of <laughs> sort of creating a specific feeling and even if you can approximate that feeling it's still not quite going to be what the author intended yeah, but if these games are puzzles and the puzzle piece is missing, you're imagining that's the scenario. One puzzle piece is missing, it's going to irk you. I'm imagining a giant puzzle where the majority of it are much larger pieces that are still there. And maybe this non-square shaped puzzle has a little edge fray that you used to not have a problem with. But now it's gone and you're like, oh, well. There's, well, that's why th- I brought up Twin Snakes because, you know, structurally that game... Uh, is still mostly there, but you know I I can't think of many people who would say that it has the same feeling as the original. Days ahead, here's here's your segue. He gave it to you. Your segue <laughs> into talking about the Metal Gear Solid movie, and this should be our last topic. Oh my god. Okay. Well, <laughs> I've put so a spot you, here. If you have to imagine Metal Gear Solid, the original game, Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, 
and then a Metal Gear Solid movie and the things they do differently, it makes you start to wonder, like, what does this movie even possibly need to do in order for someone like uh, Nitro to even like it? Okay, okay. Can I clarify one thing? <laughs> Go for um, it. If something is... I feel like there should be a distinction between a remake and a reimagining. Mm -hmm. Let's say Twin Snakes is something that I that I have a good time with because I don't see it as a remake. I see it as a reimagining. It's a different take on the yeah. on the original material. It's detached enough. But when and I think that that's that was like its goal too. He's like, I yeah. want to do a, a a you know goofier, more over the top version of this, and like you know, and that's you know he did tell the the cinematic director too to do that, like, right? To ham it up. Yeah, that wasn't even Kitamura's decision. That was something Kojima like Kitamura originally directed those cutscenes exactly like the original, and then Kojima stepped in and said, ah, "Actually, let's 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 change it up a bit." <laughs> this is why I hired you. And you know that's yeah. something that I understand. You know, a, a, like you're going to take an original. And then remix it, right? It's a remix. That's right. what the Twin Snakes is. Figures knows what we're talking about here. Damn right, I do. Yeah. So when with with Demon Souls and uh, I would say to an extent Resident Evil Two, which is a game that I really really enjoy, those those are not games that to me feel authentic to the original, even though they purport to be authentic. Like there's a, maybe that's my thing here is that I think there should be a distinction between a remake and a reimagining, and there isn't. I love a man who uses the word purport. Um, <laughs> so, I agree with you, and uh, it's, an, it's an interesting thing you say, because I feel like it sidesteps your entire concern. <laughs> because... I'm you, good at that, man, haven't you? you haven't need, you, you need talked to, to me enough? You need to realize that you're not arguing against me. You're just agreeing with me on a different subject. Yeah, there you when, go. That's how I do it. But man. when metal, when a Metal Gear Solid movie <laughs> comes about, which is looking more and more likely, are you going to like it if it's more like Twin Snakes, or are you going to like it if it's more like the original, or are you going to like it if it does its own thing, or are you just not going to like it? And what okay. I'm trying to open, not don't give me an answer just yet. All right, all right, all right. What I'm trying to open your mind up to is exactly what you said, which is let's just see what he ends up doing with it. And if it's fun and I enjoyed it, I can enjoy it as its own thing. It is the Metal Gear Solid movie. It's not the original game I played. It's not Twin Snakes. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be the vision that Kojima had or anybody who worked on it at any point. It could be okay. a Jordan Boat Roberts joint. And that is all it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you're getting out of it, and you can still be like, "Dang, that was fun. I enjoyed this." And okay, I agree with that that whole sentiment right there. That was well said, Robert. Exactly. That is the take I have. Yeah. Permanently for any remakes, remasters, reimaginings, a hundred percent is: Can you enjoy this on its own? And if you're like me, and in the case of Demon Souls, and now you just kind of don't want to go back to the PS3 version. It's not because the PS5 one necessarily replaced it. It's because you just enjoyed it more. And I do enjoy it more. And I enjoy it more for a couple reasons. One, it's easier to access at this point. Two, I think it looks prettier. Three, I don't think it takes away from my memory of what the first one brought me. It just kind of gets rid of a lot of yellow. But that's okay by me. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <sighs> okay. Hey, let me, uh, this, let me. This whole conversation reminds me of a quote from Red Letter Media. Oh, fuck. I forgot the exact thing, but it was like, I enjoy movies based off how how satisfied they make me feel. And it, it's in a sense that like, I'm probably getting the quote wrong, but it's sort of like in a sense that you were saying where it's like you come into this with sort of a breath of fresh air. You just want to see like an interpretation of the media, but there's not an expectation of of you know, a, a parody with the older games or the remake or whatnot. You just, you're just, you're, you're, it's merit is how much you enjoy it, basically. Yeah. And that, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. And I don't want to be disingenuous. There are plenty of remakes, movie or game that remove some feature or some element from what I remembered in the past. And as a result, I genuinely was disappointed. So that happens, and I'm not going to discount that opinion for sure. Oh, for sure, yeah. There's plenty of stuff that sucks. Yeah. 
But, but yeah. at the same time, <laughs> I try to, when that happens, look at the, the piece as a whole and say, yeah, but did I still like it? Because I could still like it. It's okay if it didn't do the thing I liked. And I can. That was me with uh, Metal Gear Survive, pretty much. I was like, yeah, tower defense is fun. I like the Fox engine. There's, there's monsters. There you cool. go. There you go. So, okay. by all means, hate a thing, Detroit. It's fine. <laughs> okay. I'm just all saying, right. I'm, don't, just don't go into it hating it. Just You got to let me talk, man. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. Go ahead, say something. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, say something. I, I found the original quote, and I just want to make sure I'm making this accurate. Mike said, I judge movies on whether or not I'm miserable. And I feel that. Like, I, 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 <laughs> I like to go into an open mind with films, even if, you know, I'm principally against it. Or I'm not exactly, but you just have to go in seeing if that interpretation is something you enjoy or something you don't. And that that should be independent from the media it's based off of. Okay. I'm going to take a <laughs> shot of whiskey here before I do this. Oh my gosh, here we go. I'm ready. All right. Just, I'm, I'm gonna, so excited. I gotta so excited. Get that. Okay. Hold on. I got to swig this down. Channel your Maxwell. Let's do it. Here's to Oscar Isaac playing Solid Snake in the movie. Ugh! <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that was rough. Okay, I will tell you exactly what I told Days and Fingers earlier, which is this: I want to be wrong about everything I think about the Metal Gear Solid movie and about any potential Metal Gear Solid remake. I want to be wrong. I am absolutely 100% open to the idea of a reimagining or a, or a unique take on something. What I don't like is being told that something is authentic when it's not. The movie, um, I 100% want Jordan Vote Roberts to succeed at this. My concern is that everything I've seen so far seems to suggest that what it's going to be is sort of a an animated museum of set pieces. You know, the, the South park joke about member berries. I don't, but sorry. The, the idea that, that you're being fed things that you remember. Hey, do you remember this? Do you remember the cyborg ninja? Do you remember oh, yeah, Metal Gear okay. Rex? You, like, yeah. like that. I'm worried it's going to be that, but not just that, but a self-aware version of that. That's like, yep, we're showing you the thing, you know, but that's the point we're making. That's kind of what like Silent Hill did, right? They just took yeah. sort of the trademark characters of the series and just kind of threw them wherever. Yeah. My my concern isn't whether or not it's going to be accurate. I would love for him to go absolutely balls to the wall insane with it. Just just like if you could give me like Wes Anderson's Metal Gear Solid, that would be amazing. Like mm. I like <laughs> any David Lynch's <laughs> Metal That'd Gear be amazing. Solid. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to see the wild, unpredictable thing that no one is going to expect going into the theater, right? Like there was, um, like this is this is now the age where Bandersnatch exists on Netflix. You know, media is not what we think it is, and Metal Gear Solid specifically has always challenged the medium. It's always been a piece of media that says, "Yes, we're a video game. We're somewhere in between a video game and a movie. So let's sort of like let's let's mess with that interplay between the two. Let's see what we can do to go in new directions." And I don't know how you're going to capture that ethos in just a movie because movies lack that interactive element. If you did something like Bandersnatch or hell, even something like the movie Clue. Did you, did you ever see the the adapt the the Clue movie? Oh my gosh. Like the is, board game Clue? Come on, I know that movie backwards and forwards. Backwards okay, and forwards. Okay, so so then you know they sent multiple prints out to theaters that had different endings. Right. Right? So like something like that you would need to do. You need to mess with the media. But you want like a film, fourth wall breaking some sort of meta aspect to it. Yeah, but like even fourth wall breaking isn't enough because it's about the interaction. It's about the the relationship between the player and the game, right? And and even like if you want to talk about fourth wall breaking media in film, look at Fight Club. Like Fight Fight Club's amazing. But there's only so far you can take it because there's no way you can interact with Fight Club. You can only watch it and it can talk to you but you can't talk back. And that's why I think Metal Gear Solid is kind of fated to fail if it becomes a movie, like a, just a normal movie. That's that's kind of what I'm concerned about. Now, I want to be wrong about this, but that's 
kind of where I land. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's you're like, are you are you saying that you like want all this interactive stuff to be there, or that if it tries to chase that, that it might end up, you know, kind of screwing itself over? I'm saying you're trying to square a circle. Yeah. Okay. I think I think I had this conversation when we said, "Wouldn't a Bloodborne movie be fun?" And you're like, "No." So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know what's funny is I own every single uh, Soulsborne game, and I haven't beaten one of them. Oh. Yeah. I'm taking away your card. Where's the, isn't that a thing you guys do? I'm taking away your card. Come on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's beaten, like, every single one. It's crazy. She's a better gamer than I am, and it kills me. <laughs> Shouts out to my wife. <laughs> she she does it to get away from Metal Gear for like two hours. Oh, dude, it's a mi- it's a miracle that I'm still married with how much I talk about Metal Gear. Like, I don't know how she puts up with it. Do you think with with the Metal Gear Solid movie, if it we've said before in previous episodes, like what could work on like a Netflix like animated series is if if they did some kind of like anthology type thing where it's like jumping around and showing all these different little side missions, like. With something like the movie, do you think they could jump around in the timeline and, like, there would be enough time to maybe, you know, like, when Gray Fox, say, if he, like, mentions Zanzibar Land and it kind of, like, goes back and shows that just really quick in a quick flashback sequence, you know, you can kind of tuck in these, like, mini events that have happened throughout the series that kind of give significance to it. I don't know, like, do you think something like that would work? From a personal perspective, like a subjective perspective, I, I kind of like it when movies sort of throw you in the middle of the action where it's like, because yeah. it, it, it's sort of like a wo- world building moment, right? So, in media res? In media res, exactly. Where, you know, you don't really ask, you know, there's no exposition about certain elements, but you just, you they just kind of land it on you organically. Uh, the example I can think of is like John Wick. Like they never gave us like a flashback to that, assassins community or how the coins work it was just it was just going on and then th- your brain kind of yeah. put the pieces together so that's not to suggest your idea is bad fingers because i think that would be interesting i'm just speaking from my like subjective view yeah i'm just saying based on the art that we've seen you know how it's just been all over the time period and stuff it's like it, it seems to suggest that he's not just gonna stick in the metal gear solid you know movie by itself i mean with with oscar isaac getting cast today it kind of you know it does lock in that we're dealing with solid snake at least here you know i mean to to suggest that i guess but you know i was uh first of all solid response nitroid solid response well Thank done well I'm, I'm i drank that way too fast worth the shot <laughs> worth the shot um yeah i felt like whenever he was posting all those uh metal gear fan um uh, works and art pieces this was not at all in any way or shape or form a nod to what the film would be this was simply a thing he was doing to pass the time and to like maybe even further cement his cred as the potentially good director for this franchise and douse any concerns people might have that he doesn't get the material or whatever the case is um, yeah, and he even came out and said that too. He's like, "This is just some fun stuff that I'm doing with some art buddies that I know, yeah. you know, just to kind of like I basically like I wanted to see prints of this." So <laughs> like, I, I like don't Gray Fox fighting a gecko. <laughs> I don't have a, a little selfish little art print coll- uh, commission. And I, exactly. I don't have an inkling even what kind of movie he would make from his past work. Um, I just don't have. I just don't see a directorial style that I can like pinned down for him necessarily i mean i can give you a hint <laughs> kaiju he's gonna, he's um, gonna i don't i don't know if this it. necessarily speaks to his style but one time he tweeted it, it see i think i said this on our first episode actually but he seemed like he was fishing at one point by asking like what would be the film equivalent of a hieronymus bosch painting i don't even know what that is a mess oh <laughs> man uh you should look those up i guess i will when your kid's not around. <laughs> Even less so. Um, well, what I was going to say is that in my ideal imagining, and I'm trying to keep it open mind, mind too, right? Like maybe I'll hate it, but in my ideal imagining, this, I imagine a film that takes the concepts of what uh, was introduced in Metal Gear Solid specifically and tries to wrap that around the basic plot of a mid season one blacklist episode without diving into too much subject matter at all until 
like near the end. And then unfortunately for the audience gives you probably too much to chew on in the sense that they know they'll do something more with this. Should this be successful and going that route, like going for it, like saying it doesn't matter if it's going to get a sequel, we're going to push that it gets a sequel because otherwise it won't work for us. It's a guaranteed cliffhanger. Yeah. Yeah. If they try to build if they try to build a film that is so, so self-inclusive and just, you know, throw everything else by the wayside in order to manage it. I don't think it'll work. Even if it never gets a sequel, I'd be happier knowing that they went, you know, all the way forward and said like, there's a bigger universe than, you know, and it could potentially be a huge franchise you'd love, but it may not happen. But at least you know they tried. And that's, that's, and that sounds like punishing to me as a fan because, you know, you'd be like upset if a, a film comes out and you loved it and it led to a cliffhanger and then they just never give you anything. Um, but I would be happy with that because I'd be like, well, they knew that this is one of those franchises that can't exist in a single movie. Not really. Not in any way that's significant or valuable. And yeah. the same yeah. way that the each game, could tell its own story, but the part that I enjoy about it is that it doesn't stop. And that's actually kind of the one things that I know we've had this disagreement too, is that I, I get so sad at the idea that so many fans in the Metal Gear community are like, I just wish it would end. <laughs> like they're just happy to see. Yeah. Yeah. That's me too, man. Like I, I want as many Metal Gear games as possible yeah. and like as much Metal Gear shit to happen as possible. And there's people that are just like, end it, put it, put it to its grave. Let it be over. I'm just like, you shut your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it stopped at two. It stopped at four. It stopped at five because Kojima's gone. I'm yeah. like, man, no, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen because that's the best part about that franchise to me is that it doesn't end. That it could just yeah. go I love on all the, and the different do interpretations. So so yeah. The only reason I'm against it is because that's more work for me, but that's about it. <laughs> like, you know, I it mean, gives us stuff to talk about. Five came out and it's one of those things where like they even, I mean, one of the, one of the messages, if not many of the messages, one of the messages is like, this could go on forever. And, it, and in a, both a sociopolitical way and a gaming way, it probably will. But at the same time, you kind of decide what you want to do with that. And we're not going to say one way or another whether that's a good thing for you. Uh, the only I mean, winning K- move is not to play. Yeah, Kojima's moved on, and that's great for him. But so I'd okay, be happy let me to ask you something myself because because I've had a little too much to drink right now, so I'm going to ask a question that you might not be able to answer. <laughs> um, because I might not get another chance to get an answer to this question. But as someone who worked closely with this game. Have you heard the criticism that it's supposed to feel unfinished because yeah, of, of the Phantom Paint? I've heard what that do you make yeah. of that? Is that accurate? Uh, my personal interpretation is that it is neither accurate nor inaccurate. Because, oh, damn it. Sorry. It is one of those, it's one of those things where like if you <laughs> if you are just engrossed in the drama that is a Man, what good are you? Perpetually developed game, <laughs> <laughs> or you're engrossed in the aspect of like the nuclear proliferation and it just never ending. If you know, if you're a never be game over kind of person, if you're just that, I mean, they have successfully made that their feeling continuing on despite no additional development to MGS5. But at the same time, MGS5 has I think like five or six different endings in it. So pick one, yeah. you know, stick with that and you're happy. <laughs> so it really, it's just goes either way, depending on who you are, which one do you want? Do you want to keep going? Sure. Do you want to stop? Stop. And that, you know, the, the, the criticism that came from a variety of fans or uh, even game journalist critiques that were like, Oh, it just felt like it didn't end for me. Plenty of people said that was a bad thing. And a few people said that was a good thing. And in my opinion, I was like, I don't know. It ended when I stopped playing it. I haven't played that game <laughs> in a couple of years and I'd love to go back sometime, but I'm not, you know, annoyed either way, really. Like, dude, do you want me to just go cry in a corner? Cause that's where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's just, ah, oh, gosh, it's one of those things. I'm, a, I'm such a huge <laughs> fan of this series, but I feel like in no way that anyone else is like anytime I read, like I, you know, it was my job for a couple of years there to be, 
as open to anybody's ideas as possible. But if I were to just shut everybody out and just say how I feel about it, it would have been like, five is my favorite game because it played better than any other game. And I liked the story the best because I was in control most of the time. Oh, bar and, none, there is no better stealth game mechanically. And when people would say things like, oh, the story was bad or the story wasn't what I wanted because it didn't have a lot of voice dialogue uh, directly from the main protagonist or it didn't have a lot of... <laughs> Just point them right at those tapes. Yeah, well, there, weren't, there weren't as many cutscenes as I wanted or whatever the case is. I was like, fine, you can think that way. I'm not... I'm, Who's to say you're wrong, but yeah. that didn't bother me in the least. And in fact, I liked the story better than the rest because I felt like I was directing it in a way that I was never able to do before. And frankly, in most games, not able to do since. Yeah, it is one of those things where I felt like it did something unique and I'm going to sound gushy, but beautiful in a way that like I've said this to people I worked on this game. I had a long conversation with Sean Eystone about it where I was like, it kind of angers me that people don't get this more. And like this was what I loved about this game, this was the thing that drove me to be such a big fan to get over 30, hundred hours of gameplay at time on it. Cause I was like, this is, this is done more for me story wise and experience wise than any game before it or since. And it's, we finally agree. It's just so sad that people are like, where's all my cutscenes?" or why didn't you give me a, another DLC? And I'm like, it didn't need it. Yeah. It would have been nice, but I was, Man, so impressed. Yeah, I had all my questions answered. I was, I was like fully satisfied. Yeah. I wasn't miserable after I finished the Phantom Pain. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right, cool, that's good. We got, we got full circle. And I was like, yeah, I can, I can guess what happened from here. And then we get the nuclear disarmament scene. It's like, all right, we're good. Close it up. Kingdom of the Flies is like whatever. You can kind of like fill that in between that and the original Metal Gear. It's like, all right, we're good. Yeah, there were, and there were opinions from some of the press at that. Um, press event and later that kind of voiced and echoed genuinely what I was saying only for them to have to come back later and change their mind which is perfectly viable I mean if they come back and they're like well I played it some more and kind of got, thought about it differently and I wish this happened and that's perfectly reasonable but I felt like at the moment they got it and in a lot of ways I was like oh man I wish I could you know pull them back to that moment and say remember that feeling remember that sense you had when you're like this could have gone anywhere and it, I was kind of in control and it made so much more sense to me as a, as a whole project to be that way, to be that, that person running, you know, running the game, running the story from, through the game as opposed to just being told what was happening around me. Now, did you listen to the tapes while you were walking around or did you listen to them in the helicopter? I did both. It just, you know, different yeah. playthroughs. Just mix it up, kind of throw it in, whatever. Yeah, I think a lot of people just piled them on and like in, in like long sessions and just sat there and got bored and then just like kind of checked out. That's that's what I saw a lot of. I, I, I see like a lot of comments on the Solid Snake page that I run. I mean, this and is there's just people that are like, what story? There was no story. I'm like, did you listen to the tapes? Like, yeah, you're supposed to get it through osmosis. Yeah, I will. I will tell you, we we disagree on a lot of stuff, particularly in terms of Metal Gear going on perpetually. But um, the fa we do not disagree on this because the Phantom Pain gave me a closure for the series that MGS4 did not. Yeah, for sure. Um, because it said to me, like you said, this could go on forever. You know, it's up to you to decide when to put it down. Yeah. And I played that game religiously for a very long time. And then I put it down and I really haven't picked it up since maybe, maybe again, some time to have some fun. But for the most part, I got I got what it was putting out there. You know, yeah. you got, you know, uh, just I, I applaud you guys for what you made because that game is phenomenal. I wish I could take credit for more of it, but I was very happy to be involved as much as I was. Yeah, man. Like I said, that was my most played game that year for sure. I, I definitely clocked in over 300 hours and was in the uh, the top FOB for a while. So yeah, I got my ass kicked uh, on those FOBs, weird. but I did not <laughs> care. It was fun. Yeah, it was like top thousand. So. Nice. Did all right. All right. I, I better take off, but I'm going to end it on one more thing. I was heartbroken when so many people liked Witcher 3 more than MGS5. I was like, come on, really? Witcher oh, 3? Get out of here. Give right. me a Witcher break. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're not Witcher fans. <laughs> Seriously? Hot oh, take. Have you, yeah. have you tried that combat? It is, it is bad. It is all right bad. <laughs> uh, real quick, are you uh, looking forward to Cyberpunk? Uh, I am in the sense that I want to give it a try, but you know, I'm not like the biggest fan of the genre either. So I'm just like, ah, yeah, uh, yeah, give it a yeah. shot. Why not? Fair enough. It's, it looks good. They worked on it for 10 years. Why not? That's an exaggeration. I don't know how long they worked on it. Hey, 
Robert, thank you so much for coming on, man. This is uh, uh, this has been a privilege. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Robert, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. I would, you know, I'm going to say something. I wish you guys would invite me on again because I don't want this to be our only conversation. We had a great time. Yeah, we'd love to have you back, man. It makes us really happy when guests say that. Yeah, we got to settle the score. Dude, I'll take, We're not done. Yeah, we I'll got- take any <laughs> opportunity to watch you fuck with Nitroid. This is like glorious. <laughs> I want to get to know Days Ahead more. I barely know you. We, you didn't say half a word. Come on. <laughs> I get that a lot. It's my fault. I, I talk way too much and I talk over you and I interrupt people, especially if it's nitride, I'll interrupt them. So, man, <laughs> this is not fair. All right. Pad your episodes, uh, your upcoming episodes with all those people I mentioned and then uh, invite me back sometime. Okay, guys? Sounds good. Right. Sounds good. All right, cool. Uh, do you want to plug where people can find uh, your studio? Uh, yeah, Unbroken Studios. Um, you don't have to watch us now because we're not going to say anything for quite some time. But when we do, uh, get ready because we are making some super fantastic games that I'm very happy with and very excited to be working on. And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just jazzed to do be, be doing more AAA stuff with games that I love and potential communities that I'm going to really, really engage in. Hell yeah, man. Awesome, Looking man. Forward we look to forward to it. it. Looking forward to it. All right. Take it easy, everyone. <laughs> Jinx. All right, man. Thanks again for coming on.